The following is a special documentary episode of The Week in Doubt. Thanks for listening and or watching. The goat of Mentis. The devil himself. That was Christopher Lee in the 1968 film The Devil Rides Out. I couldn't resist. But contrary to what Christopher Lee's character says, 19th century French occultist Eliphas Levi's Baphomet figure, aka the Goat of Mendes or Sabbatic Goat, wasn't intended to be a representation of the Christian devil. Although admittedly Levi did supposedly draw at least aesthetic inspiration from the devil card of the medieval tarot, Levi's Baphomet was meant to symbolize balance, the totality of the absolute, and a kind of union of binary opposites, male and female, good and evil. But you may be wondering, didn't you already do a rather thorough, yet concise, documentary episode on the subject of Baphomet? Why are we revisiting this topic? Well, a friendly YouTube viewer enjoyed the first Baphomet special so much that he requested another, and sometimes that's all it takes. Ask and you shall receive, as the saying goes. And that goes for anyone who appreciates the show. Feel free to make a suggestion or request that I cover a certain topic, etc. And I also want to clarify for those of you who may have seen the first Baphomet documentary that I believe I pronounce the name Eliphas Levy. But upon further research, it appears that Levi is the more proper pronunciation, so that's what I'm going to be going with. But since that first Baphomet episode was rather thorough, in my humble opinion, I knew trying to find enough material for a second might prove to be something of a challenge. I've long been interested in or fascinated by the Baphomet symbol, which is why I wanted to cover it on the show in the first place. So I had already come to the topic with some basic knowledge when I did that first documentary special, and in addition wanting to be as thorough and informative as possible, I scoured the internet looking for additional information, double-checked my facts, and then distilled everything down into a roughly 20-minute script. So what I think I'll do this time is review some of the content from the first special for the sake of context, or as a refresher, and then also try to elaborate or expand on some aspects I may not have fully explored the first time around. I already mentioned how for Eliphas Levi, this Baphomet or Sabbatic goat figure he created was meant to symbolize balance or a union of opposites. So what I think I'll do is play a clip from the last special in which I read a description of the figure in Levi's own words. For context, he's referencing it as a frontispiece illustration in his two-volume work entitled, when translated from French to English, Dogma and Ritual of High Magic. Frontispiece just being a fancy term for an illustration facing the title page of a book. And it should be noted that Levi actually drew the illustration himself. And if you look at that famous Baphomet drawing, you can actually see his name down in the lower left, on the kind of round base beneath the figure. But here's the clip. The goat on the frontispiece carries the sign of the pentagram on the forehead, with one point at the top, a symbol of light, his two hands forming the sign of occultism, the one pointing up to the white moon of Hesed, the other pointing down to the black one of Gabura. This sign expresses the perfect harmony of mercy with justice. His one arm is female, the other male like the ones of the androgyne of Kunrath the attributes of which we had to unite with those of our goat, because he is one in the same symbol. The flame of intelligence shining between his horns is the magic light of the universal balance, the image of the soul elevated above matter, as the flame whilst being tied to matter shines above it. 
The beast's head expresses the horror of the sinner, whose materially acting, solely responsible part has to bear the punishment exclusively, because the soul is insensitive according to its nature, and can only suffer when it materializes. The rod standing instead of genitals symbolizes eternal life, the body covered with scales the water, the semicircle above it the atmosphere. The feathers following above the volatile. Humanity is represented by the two breasts and the androgyne arms of the sphinx of the occult sciences. And so I'm glad I'm doing this follow-up episode because I've realized there's a number of things just in that description in Levi's own words that I didn't really explore last time. For instance, he says his two hands forming the sign of occultism the one pointing up to the white moon of Hesed, the other pointing down to the black one of Govora. And what I believe Levi is referencing here is the maxim, as above, so below, a principle which can be found in both occultism and alchemy, there of course being an overlap between the two. As referenced by Levi, the Baphomet or Sabbatic goat figure is pictured with one hand pointing upward above and the other pointed downward below, and the upward pointing arm bears the Latin inscription salve, to separate or dissolve, and the other arm coagula, meaning to bring together or clot, as in coagulate. And from my understanding, this principle of as above, so below refers to a perceived correlation between events in the celestial realm above and events below on the earth. As above, so below is a shortened paraphrasing of a saying found in a hermetic text called the Emerald Tablet, which according to Arabic sources may go as far back as the 8th or 9th century CE. The original wording translated into English reads, That which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. The authorship of the Emerald Tablet is attributed to a legendary figure known as Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, and that's where the term Hermetic comes from. You may be familiar, for example, with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a 19th century secret society or occult organization that infamous British occultist Aleister Crowley belonged to for a time. Crowley had actually adopted the name Baphomet as a member of another occult secret society, the OTO, or Ordo Templi Orientis. Although Crowley wasn't the founder of the organization, once admitted he quickly rose to power. Levi, as already mentioned, describes one hand pointing to the white moon of Hesed and the other downward to the black moon of Gavora. Hesed and Gavora are references to the Kabbalistic tree of life in Jewish mysticism. Both Hesed meaning kindness and Gavora strength or severity being so-called sephirot, in Kabbalah, a sephira, singular, being one of the ten attributes or emanations through which the Ein Sof, or infinite, is said to reveal itself. Despite his name and strong interest in Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism, Levi wasn't Jewish. In fact, in early adulthood, he had entered the seminary, becoming a deacon in the Roman Catholic Church. Eliphaz Levi was an adopted pen name. He believed it to be a close approximation of his birth name, Alphonse Louis, transliterated into Hebrew. In that clip, Levi, or me reading Levi's words, also mentions the mysterious-sounding androgyne of Kunrath. Kunrath almost sounds like something from the Evil Dead. Gunda. But it's actually a reference to 16th century physicist, hermetic philosopher, and alchemist Heinrich Kunrath. The androgyne Levi refers to is a hermaphroditic alchemical symbol or figure that appears in Kunrath's book, Amphitheatrum Sapientia Eternae, Amphitheater of Eternal Wisdom, which has come to be regarded as an alchemical or occult classic. 
I should note that the arms of Kunrath's hermaphrodite figure, also known as a rebus, a successful union of opposites or differing qualities, in the end product of the great work, also bear the words salve and coagula. Not surprising seeing as Levi says that his Baphomet figure in Kunrath's androgyne are one and the same. Levi thought that alleged medieval devil worship was actually a continuation of pre-existing pagan rites, and here I'll borrow another clip from the first Baphomet episode, in which Levi describes the devil of the medieval tarot. Below this figure we read a frank and simple inscription, the devil. Yes, we confront here that phantom of all terrors, the dragon of all theogenies, the Araman of the Persians, the Typhon of the Egyptians, the Python of the Greeks, the old serpent of the Hebrews, the fantastic monster, the nightmare, the crocmitan, the gargoyle, the great beast of the Middle Ages, and worse than all these the Baphomet of the Templars, the bearded idol of the alchemist, the obscene deity of Mendes, the goat of the Sabbath. The frontispiece to this ritual reproduces the exact figure of the terrible emperor of night, with all his attributes and all his characters. Yes, in our profound conviction, the Grand Masters of the Order of Templars worship the Baphomet and caused it to be worshipped by their initiates. Yes, there existed in the past, and there may be still in the present, assemblies which are presided over by this figure, seated on a throne and having a flaming torch between the horns. But the adorers of this sign do not consider, as do we, that it is a representation of the devil. On the contrary, for them, it is that of the god Pan, the god of our modern schools of philosophy, the god of the Alexandrian Thurgic school, and of our own mystical Neoplatonists, the god of Lamartine and Victor Cousin, the god of Spinoza and Plato, the god of the primitive Gnostic schools, the Christ also of the dissident priesthood. The mysteries of the Sabbath have been variously described, but they figure always in grimoires and in magical trials. The revelations made on the subject may be classified under three heads. One, those referring to a fantastic and imaginary Sabbath. Two, those which betray the secrets of the occult assemblies of veritable adepts. Three, revelations of foolish and criminal gatherings, having for their object the operations of black magic. And so, like Christopher Lee in that opening clip, Eliphas Levi mentions Mendes, the obscene deity of Mendes to be precise, and once again the goat of Mendes was another name given to his Baphomet or Sabbatic goat figure. So what exactly is the goat of Mendes? Well, Mendes was the Greek name for the ancient Egyptian city of Jedet, and I found this quote from 19th century Egyptologist and what would have been called back in the day Orientalist, E. A. Wallace Budge. At several places in the Delta, Hermopolis, Lycopolis, and Mendes, the god Pan and a goat were worshipped. Strabo, quoting Pindar, says that in these places goats had intercourse with women, and Herodotus instances a case which was said to have taken place in the open day. The Mendesians, according to this last writer, paid reverence to all goats, and more to the males than to the females, and particularly to one he-goat, on the death of which public mourning is observed throughout the whole Mendesian district. They call both Pan and the goat Mendes, and both were worshipped as gods of generation and fecundity. Diodorus compares the cult of the goat of Mendes with that of Priapus and groups the god with the pans and the satyrs. And fittingly enough, Jedet was supposedly also known as Per Banam Jedet, the domain of the ram lord of Jedet. Banam Jedet, or Banamjeb, being the Egyptian name of the ram god whose cult was centered in Mendes. And I'll also note that the jed was a common symbol in ancient Egypt. It's pillar-shaped with a series of horizontal crossbars. It represented stability and is thought to have been inspired by the shape of the spine. 
possibly more specifically, the sacrum of a bull. It was also thought of as being the backbone of the god Osiris. But I'll read a quote from the Greek historian Herodotus directly, and this is from his histories. The reason the Egyptians I mentioned do not sacrifice goats of either gender is as follows. The Mendesians count Pan as one of the eight gods, and according to them the eight gods precede the twelve gods. Pan's portrait in Egypt, as represented by artists and sculptors, is the same as it is in Greece, that is with a goat's head and a he-goat's legs. It is not that they think he looks like that, he is no different from any of the other gods in their view. However, I should prefer not to explain why they depict him that way. Mendesians regard all goats as sacred, he-goats more than she-goats, and goat herds of male goats are held in particular respect. One he-goat is chosen to be an especial object of veneration, and when it dies, the whole Mendesian province is given over to mourning. In the Egyptian language, the word Mendes means he-goat, as well as pan. A remarkable thing happened in this province in my time. A goat mated with a woman, for all to see. This happened in public view. And of course Herodotus was viewing things through a Greek lens, and was probably projecting Greek concepts onto Egyptian gods. And I believe the scholarly consensus is that Herodotus in general isn't necessarily always a reliable source. He wasn't operating within the mindset of, say, a modern journalist, and didn't really seem to have any real compunctions about conflating fact and fiction. But there is probably at least some truth to the story. The ancient Egyptians deeply revered a number of animals, including the ram. And there were certain Egyptian deities who were sometimes depicted as having either the head or horns of a ram, including the aforementioned Benabjed, who was associated with Mendes, and also the god Amun or Amun, I believe. Now, Levi also mentions the quote-unquote Baphomet of the Templars. I covered the relationship between Baphomet and the Templars fairly extensively in the first documentary episode or special, but I'll give a quick rundown once again. Established sometime between 1118 and 1119, and officially endorsed by the Church, the Christian military order charged with protecting pilgrims, known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, or more simply the Knights Templar, became a popular charity throughout Christendom, and quickly amassed wealth and power. They gained further wealth through trading and through the donated resources, money, and property of members who were required to take an oath of poverty upon joining. They also became a powerful banking organization. They ran a large network of banks that allowed pilgrims to deposit money in Europe and withdraw from that balance once in the Holy Land. Their sophisticated yet streamlined system is thought to have laid the blueprint for modern banking. It could be said that perhaps the Templars became a bit too powerful or successful for their own good. The King of France, Philip IV, was in deep financial debt to the Templars, and it's thought that he seized on some lurid allegations made against the order in an attempt to free himself from his financial burden. In the year 1307, at dawn on Friday the 13th of October, Philip IV ordered the arrest of numerous Templars, including Grand Master Jacques de Molay. They were accused of fraud and financial corruption, as well as some of the more salacious allegations alluded to a moment ago, which included supposed blasphemous initiation rituals involving such offenses as spitting on the cross, denying Christ, and quote-unquote indecent kissing. And it should be noted that some of these offenses were only confessed to or corroborated under torture or duress. Now, the most important allegation for the sake of this documentary or topic at hand is that the Templars were said to have worshipped an idol or head that they called Baphomet. And here I should make the point that, although Eliphas Levi's Baphomet or Sabbatic goat symbol is a 19th century invention, 
The name Baphomet itself can be traced at least as far back as the Templars. One of the more popular theories concerning the etymology of the name is that it's a corruption of the name Mohammed. Apparently at the time, Mahomet was a contemporary variant of Muhammad, and the Templars had been accused of adopting Saracen or Muslim religious practices. Furthermore, apparently the word Mahomet had become a generalized term in Christendom for a false idol. And this is yet another reason I'm glad I'm doing this follow-up special, because I want to address something that happened in the wake of the first Baphomet episode. A number of Muslim viewers in the YouTube comments section angrily chastised me for suggesting that there was a link between the name Muhammad and Baphomet. Now, I try to be a fairly empathetic person, and I could imagine emotionally it mustn't be pleasant to have your deeply revered prophet compared to a hermaphroditic goat monster, but logically getting upset doesn't really make any sense. In the original episode, I offer alternate potential explanations for the origins of the name Baphomet, and even if the idea that it's a corruption of the name Muhammad is true, it says nothing about Islam. You have to remember the context. The Templars were Crusader Knights at war with the Saracens or Muslims, so true or not, accusing them of adopting Muslim religious practices or worshipping Muhammad or some corrupt thing named after Muhammad was probably one of the most serious accusations you could level against them. So it says more about the times than it does Muhammad or Islam. But there is a theory, although I'm not certain of its validity, that paints the Templars in a more sympathetic light, at least from a Christian perspective. It suggests that the Templars very well may have engaged in sacrilegious behavior, such as spitting on the cross, or even pretending to pay lip service to Islam in some context or during certain rites, but that it was more a kind of preparation or conditioning in the event that they ever found themselves captured by the enemy, the goal being to stay true to Christ in your heart despite your outward actions. And I'm not sure if it goes directly to this point, but there is record of a young Templar named Raymond de la Fierre who confessed that he had spat on the cross three times, but quote-unquote, only from my mouth and not from my heart. The exact nature of the idol the Templars supposedly worshipped varies from account to account, and this could simply be due to the unreliability of rumor and forced confession. Some say it was a mummified head, possibly that of John the Baptist, a head with three faces, or even a cat. The Templars did in fact supposedly possess some silver gilt heads that served as reliquaries, one bearing the strange inscription, Caput or Head 58. Among the heads may have been those of Saint Euphemia, and even that of Hugues de Payan himself, the co-founder and first Grand Master of the Templars. Pressured by Philip IV, Pope Clement issued a papal bull in 1307 that mandated Christian monarchs arrest all Templars and seize their assets. In 1312, under threat of military action from Philip, Clement officially disbanded the order. Ultimately, dozens of Templars, including Grand Master Jacques de Molier, were burned at the stake from the flames de Molier supposedly shouted, God knows who is wrong and who has sinned. Soon a calamity will occur to those who have condemned us to death. As the story goes, Pope Clement, who had believed the allegations against the Templars to be false, but as mentioned relented to pressure from Philip IV, died a month later, and the king himself is said to have died before the year's end due to a hunting accident or a cerebral stroke suffered while hunting. I mentioned alternate theories regarding the origin of the name Baphomet, in his 1975 work entitled, appropriately enough, Le Baphomet, writer, translator, and artist Pierre Klasowski suggests that Baphomet is a coded amalgam, borrowing letters from various words, the Ba from Basilius, Fo from Philosophorum, and Met from Metalloricum. 
A German bookseller and Freemason by the name of Christoph Friedrich Nikolai believed that the Templars were Gnostics and that Baphomet was a Greek compound word meaning quote-unquote baptism of wisdom. Gnostic or Gnosticism from the Greek gnosis or knowledge is a blanket term for a number of early sects or religious systems, many of them Christian or rising out of the Jewish Christian milieu in the first century, that placed a strong emphasis on mysticism and secret or self-knowledge. Sophia, from the Greek meaning wisdom, was an important figure in Gnostic cosmology, being one of the divine aeons or emanations and the unwitting mother of the demiurge, a kind of corrupted or insane lesser godlike being responsible for making the material world and trapping spirit in matter. 19th century French lexographer, Freemason, and philosopher Emile Littre asserted that the word was formed Kabbalistically by writing backwards the abbreviation for Templi Omnium Hominum Pacis Abbas, shades of Harry Potter, meaning abbot or father of the Temple of Peace of all men. Apparently his source was the so-called Abbe Constant, none other than Alphonse Louis Constant, the one and only Eliphas Levi. According to Hugh J. Schoenfield, a scholar who had worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the word Baphomet was created by using what's referred to as the Atbash Substitution Cipher, a monoalphabetic cipher originally used to encode the Hebrew language. He argued that by applying the cipher to the word Baphomet, it could be interpreted as being an encoded form of the Greek word Sophia, meaning wisdom. Crowley in his confessions claimed to have solved the mystery of the name, writing, One theory of the name is that it represents the words, and here Crowley mentions the baptism of wisdom theory. Another is that it is a corruption of a title meaning Father Mithras, Mithras being a solar deity whose cult became very popular in the Greco-Roman world. Needless to say, the suffix R supported the latter theory, I added up the word as spelt by the wizard, and I actually did an entire documentary special on Crowley, almost two hours long, I think, and I have no idea who the wizard is in this context. It totaled 729. This number had never appeared in my Kabbalistic working, and therefore meant nothing to me. It, however, justified itself as being the cube of nine, the word Kephos, the mystic title given by Christ to Peter, as the cornerstone of the church, has this same value. So far, the wizard had shown great qualities. He had cleared up the etymological problem and shown why the Templars should have given the name Baphomet to their so-called idol. Baphomet was Father Mithras, the cubical stone which was the corner of the temple. I'm not sure if there's any merit to Crowley's theory, I'll let you decide. Now, the person who requested this episode also requested that I touch on the relationship between Baphomet and modern Satanism again. So yes, both the late Anton LaVey's Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple use the symbol of a goat's head in an inverted pentagram. This symbol can be traced back to yet another 19th century French occultist by the name of Stanislas de Guaita. It first appeared in his book, Le Clef de la Magie Noire, The Key to Black Magic. De Guaita's pentagram features five Hebrew letters, one at each point forming the word Leviathan. Inside the circle around the goat's head are the names Samael and Lilith. Samael being an archangel whose name means venom or poison of God, sometimes identified as the angel of death, and Lilith being Adam's first wife in Jewish folklore. Teguida saw this inverted pentagram as being associated with evil, the downward-facing fifth point symbolizing the reign of matter over spirit. The Church of Satan, founded in the 1960s, would adopt this so-called sigil of Baphomet, minus the words Lilith and Samael. The newer Satanic Temple has also adopted a more stylized version. Both the Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple are strains of what is known as non-theistic Satanism. They're essentially atheistic organizations who lack belief in a literal devil, 
but view him more as a symbol of rebellion and free thought. LeVay's Church of Satan embraces a more social Darwinist might-makes-right ideology, while the Satanic Temple takes a more secular humanist approach, practicing social activism, fighting for reproductive and LGBTQ rights, and seeking to safeguard the separation of church and state. De Guida also depicted an upward-facing pentagram, containing what is known as the pentagrammaton, the Hebrew letters forming a version of Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua. Although the symbols appear in De Guida's book, the idea of an inverted pentagram symbolizing evil and an upright one symbolizing holiness apparently originates with Eliphaz Levi. Founded in the late 1970s, the English metal band Venom also adopted the sigil of Baphomet, bearing a stylized version of the band's name above the goat's head. In an attempt to make this episode really special, perhaps I'll end with a personal anecdote. And I don't think I've ever divulged this on the show before, so it may prove somewhat embarrassing. But I remember having this vivid dream back when I was still in my teens, I believe. But I was in some kind of infernal realm or hoary netherworld. It was dark and rocky, with lurid flames springing up here and there. And there was a giant cross-legged Baphomet figure with open arms. And I was levitating in the air, moving towards it against my will, as if I was caught in its gravitational pull. And when it had finally pulled me near, it embraced me and I woke up. Now, any Christians listening could probably have a field day with this, suggesting that I was actually being seduced by satanic or occult forces. I'm now a non-believer, but I was raised Catholic, and I can remember seeing pentagrams and demonic goat imagery as a child and being spooked by it. So it could have just been a manifestation of that, or residual Catholic guilt clashing with my interest in dark heavy metal music and that kind of thing, but either way, one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. But with that, I think I'm going to bring our second Baphomet special to a close. Not sure if there'll ever be a third, but as always, thank you for listening and or watching.